Good morning readers, it's Tilly here from Tilly Shelf and welcome to another bookish breakfast. I think it might be a little bit of a long one today because as you can see there's quite a stack of books here and I've also taken a few notes on things I want to say so I'm going to try and keep it, keep to the notes and keep it relatively quick for the length. Um, so yeah, the first book I wanted to talk about was The Casual Vacancy. So I mentioned at um, the end of last week that I had started to read this one and I have now finished it. Um, it was very, very quick to read and quick to finish. I did enjoy it, so I got through it very quickly. Um, I have to say though, it wasn't as good as it should have been. Um, so I think Rowling kind of specialises in a really convoluted climax that then necessitates um, a good couple of chapters of just explanation of what went on um, <laughs> just so that you can get your head around all of the like why why was all that going on um, at the end of the book and it's it, it doesn't always work very well it's not always very enjoyable I think I tolerated it a bit more with the Harry Potter books than um, I do with this one and I think her natural style of writing um, is more kind of a mystery book where you do get that explanation at the end of like oh you've caught the murderer and then you get to explain oh and they did this and they did this and they did this and this is why all of these clues appeared um, I think that is what she kind of wants to be writing um, when she's trying to write other things um, so yeah, so I thought one of the main problems with this book was there were too many characters and I liked all the characters, I cared about all of the characters, um, but there were too many of them and she should have just like kept it a little bit smaller. And I understand that she was trying to talk about the entire community and that she was trying to give that range of characters. And it is quite impressive that she was almost as believable um, through all of the characters, everyone from like a you know conservative um, granny to a weed smoking 14 year old boy. Um, I'm, I'm impressed that she was able to capture all of those different voices to a certain extent um, but I think it would have been a better book if she'd been just a little bit more focused because I felt like I didn't really get a satisfying story for any of the characters um, and it was more like an, an overview instead of um, an actual focused telling if that makes sense. Um, but it did have a good atmosphere so I think it, it I know I just said that she should be writing mysteries um, it reminded me most of Agatha Christie and the kind of like um, poison pen letters I think it's there's a book called The Moving Finger where there are these poison pen letters sent around the village and there are consequences to those letters um, and I think that that was kind of a heavy inspiration for this or if it wasn't then there was just a, a very strong association between the plots um, and it's interesting it's like this kind of small community and the impact that it has when people start um, saying what they actually think in an anonymous way within that small community it, it, it's it's an interesting thing to look at I think um, but I would say that she's too nice to people um, so it's kind of it's a very very um, generous approach to looking at people in which you say um, and you write in the book like you don't just speculate that everyone and um, it's like every negative character trait has a corresponding traumatic event in somebody's childhood that meant that they have that negative character trait and I'm all for giving people the benefit of the doubt and I, I really do try to always look and say oh you know we don't know what's we don't know why this is this person's acting in this way so you know we're gonna treat them nicely anyway um, but it's something that I very much believe in but I found it a little bit excessive when we were being introduced to these characters who were being quite unpleasant and then every single one of them would be like looking back to oh this time when this horrible thing happened um, yeah there's quite a lot of um, horrible events in a relatively short book and most of them are in like short flashbacks of like oh and then when I was young this happened and da 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 um, so yeah I just I felt that just stretched the boundaries of credibility or that it's okay to have a couple of representative examples but to try and put it in for everyone is just a little bit too much um and then we have this character of um mr fairbrother barry barry is it barry um yeah uh, it doesn't even say on the blurb um so barry um fairbrother um dies at the start and he is like this atticus finch type character so i think i compared it to to kill a mockingbird as well in my last video and i think that that um, holds. I think that's kind of what she was trying to go for um, and he was this Atticus Finch type character that kind of held it all together and was able to see the best in everybody and be really positive, um, a positive influence on the community and the people around him and it's this kind of myth that um, one educated man is all it takes to kind of build social cohesion um, that I just felt a little bit was outside of the realms of credibility um, I also, I kind of, I thought I knew what happened in the end of this because I watched the adaptation 
um, years ago when it first came out, which I think would have been about 2013. Um, but the adaptation actually changes the ending. Um, and I think it's another thing with Rowling is she likes these kind of nice, symmetrical, wholesome endings. So it's not a happy ending, but everything kind of like ties in together. Um, and for saying that I think she wanted to write a kind of gritty, realistic book, gritty, realistic books should not have neatly tied in endings. So yeah, mixed feelings about this book. If I was a star rating kind of person, I probably would have given it three stars because I enjoyed it, but I felt like it didn't really live up to its potential. Um, so yeah, so that's The Casual Vacancy. Then, okay, I'm just going to read this out from my notes. Um, I'll talk it for the next, like, book topic. A young person is leading a relatively normal but not perfectly happy life when some slightly unusual things start to happen to them. Suddenly, they are told that they have been selected to be sent far away across the country to undertake specialised training and confront dangerous challenges. Their family is not particularly happy about this, but after some preparation, they board a long-distance train and soon find themselves negotiating a new set of relationships with their peers and their situation as they head in to face these challenges. Um, so that is, broadly speaking, the setup for The Hunger Games. It's the first couple of chapters of The Hunger Games as this, these events happen. It's also the start of the very first book of the Harry Potter series, and we are making pretty good progress on the last book there. Maybe coming up to a third of the way through, so hopefully we're going to get this that finished this year. But that's not the book that I'm talking about. The book that I'm talking about is Vita Nostra by Marina and Sergei... Sergei Jekenko. Jekenko. Um, who are Ukrainian authors who wrote this uh, book, Vita Nostra, in Russian. So clearly that's set up of a young person um, setting out on a train to go to this like specialised training institute um, is YA gold, because I'm really enjoying it so far. I would have to say that Vita Nostra is quite a lot more sinister than Harry Potter or The Hunger Games, um, so it's quite a lot more sin sinister than a book series where um, the main baddie tries to conquer death and a book series where the kids try and kill each other in a small arena. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a little bit dark. Um, it also seems quite a lot um, deeper, like not deep as in, you know, earth shattering philosophical, philosophical stuff, um, but it's definitely raising more questions and um, it's just a little bit more maybe analytical in terms of the writing. Um, so I'm enjoying this. This book, Flip Listen, Oh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, this one, um, Bo listened to this on audiobook, um, maybe in about August or something, like a little while ago. And ever since then, he has been telling me, like, constantly, you need to read this book. And every time I try and recommend a book to him, he's like, ah, no, 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 but you've still not read Vita Nostra. Um, so he went out and he bought a paper copy because I prefer reading paper copies and he likes to have um, copies of the books that he's listened listen to. Um, and I've started it this week and I've made it a decent chunk of the way about there. Um, and yeah, so this, the main character, Sasha, has just arrived at this uh, Institute of Special Technologies. Um, and it's really good so far. I would say it's an older book than the other books that I mentioned. I think she is uh, 16 or 17. Um, and it is based around the idea of, um, she's around the time where she would be going to college or to university. So it's, it's looking more at that kind of demographic of leaving home for the first time and like at an age where you, you expect to leave home for the first time um but in a way that you weren't expecting to do so um, and it's got kind of like i would recommend it if you know anyone who's just started uni or about to go and start uni um i would probably recommend this as a book for them because it's got like everything in terms of like having to politely ask your roommates not to smoke to um just sitting down to read your new subjects and having absolutely no idea what it says in the textbooks um for magical reasons when it comes to sasha but it's definitely something that i felt like um would be relatable to a lot of university students um so yes, that's enjoyable so far, and hopefully we'll get through the rest of it with equal enjoyment. Uh, do I have anything else to say about that? Oh, um, the one thing that I would say is the prose isn't very sparkly. Like, it, it seems quite um, flat. Um, not in a bad way, it's just very direct. And I don't know whether that's a feature of the translation or a feature of the style. Um, but it, it definitely wants me, it, it wants me, it makes me want to keep reading. Um, so it's not like bad writing, it's just, it doesn't really, um, like, inspire in terms of the writing. Um, so yeah, so that's Vita Nostra. 
Then another thing that I read was a poem called, oh I've lost my marker for it, um, Xantippe by Amy Levy. So Amy Levy was a Victorian poet, as you can see, this is my Victorian poetry anthology, um, who was writing towards the end of the Victorian period and she was one of the first women to go to Cambridge and she wrote this poem Xantippe and theoretically it is like a commentary on the state of education in Cambridge. Um, I didn't really get that because I don't really know what education in Cambridge was like at that time. Um, so basically Xantippe was the, the wife of Socrates and I think there is this long-standing myth about her where she spills wine all over Socrates. Um, and Amy Levy has taken that incident and turned it into a poem in which Xantippe gets so frustrated by Socrates neglecting her and neglecting her ability to um, join him in his intellectual pursuits that she kind of, yeah, she gets to this point where her frustration builds up and she almost proves him right in that he's saying, oh, you know, you're just emotional and not relevant. Um, and she kind of like throws this wine over him because she is so um, just like angry at how she is being neglected. So I found it very interesting. I think I will read it again to just kind of glean a little bit more meaning from it. Uh, but I did enjoy it. And I just wanted to read a little bit more from Amy Levy because I had not heard of her before Victober this year and I read one short poem by her for Victober and I just wanted to um, dip a little bit further in. Um, so that is the end of Xantope. Then what next? So also on the subject of fantasy, um, I mean that's a myth but it's kind of fantasy, I finally finished The Return of the King um, by J.R.R. Tolkien and the audiobook didn't include the appendixes um, so I might have to read the appendixes um, if, you, if you've not read it, you won't know, but the last kind of third of the paper book, or uh, quarter maybe, is um, just like Tolkien's writings about hobbits and alphabets and linguistics and stuff. Um, like he's got little um, runic alphabet charts and he's got um, hobbit family trees. It's very encyclopedic um, and quite fun. Um, so I enjoy. I really enjoyed listening to the audiobooks again and now excitingly we get to watch the films again. So as soon as we get three nights off in a row, which is not going to be for quite some time, we'll probably be re-watching all of those films. Um, so yeah, so that was a good um, audiobook to listen to. And then my next audiobook is going to be The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, because again, Bo listened to this one earlier in the year, um, and I've been wanting to return to the story and just see if I enjoy it again on a second read as much as I did on the first read. So yeah, looking forward to giving that one a go again. Um, I'm actually not doing too badly for time so far. So then at uni yesterday we had, one of our lectures was cancelled, so our program director who is um, a woman called Claire Butchinger, um, hard surname to pronounce, um, decided to step in and do her like little talk about what she does and she says this is not a, this is a nice to know not a need, need to know um, kind of talk in that I'm just here to try and like inspire you to go forward with what you're doing in terms of um, the, the things that you're learning on the course um, and she is a really really inter inspirational lady and she's done so much um, just as one person and the, at the end of the talk she said you, um, that one of her favourite proverbs is um, if you think you're too small to make a difference try sleeping in a room with a mosquito um, so yeah so Claire has been a dedicated mosquito for many many years um, in terms of trying to make a difference um, to the lives of, of vulnerable people um, working with the ICRC International Committee of um, Red Cross and Red Crescent in um, numerous war zones and also working um, in terms of um, with malnourished children and so on um, just making a huge difference really as one individual um, so after her talk I went up to the library to pick up her book because I thought I'll be ahead of the crowd because there's only two copies so I'm going to make sure that I get one um, so her book is called Moving Mountains so I'm going to read that just to get a little bit more of a background to the stuff that she's done this is such an old copy of the book like it's got pictures in it um, that are like practically falling out, falling out, like in a new version, it wouldn't be like that, would it? But anyway, so I just thought I'd, I'd have a read of that, but I've not started it yet. The one that I have started was on the same shelf, and this one has been catching my eye for a while, because in a library full of books that look a bit like this, most of which are called The Epidemiology of the Dengue Fever in the wherever, um, and other such relatively uninspiring names. Um, this one has got a really jazzy spine um, and it's called Band-Aid for a Broken Leg and it's by Damien Brown. I'm just going to read you the blurb. 
Damien Brown, a young doctor, thinks he's ready when he arrives for his first pro fo Let's try that again, shall we? Damien Brown, a young doctor, thinks he's ready when he arrives for his first posting with Médecins Sans Frontières in Africa. But the town he's sent to is, in an I is an isolated outpost of mud huts surrounded by landmines. The hospital, for which he's to be the only doctor, is filled with malnourished children and conditions he's never seen, and the health workers, Angolan war veterans twice his age who speak no English, walk out on him following an altercation on his first shift. In the months that follow, Damien confronts these challenges, all the while dealing with the social absurdities of living with only three other volunteers for company. The medical calamities pile up, a leopard attack, landmine explosions, performing surgery using instruments cleaned on the fire, but as Damien's friendships with the local people evolve, his passion for the work grows. So I thought that sounded interesting and I like, I've been having a, a good fun reading a lot of medical memoirs this year, um, particularly ones that kind of deal with um, the look at work abroad and also look at some of the kind of like absurdities and complexities of um, working in other countries um, and like cultural differences and so on. Um, so I, I mean, I read that blurb and I was like, oh my God, how could you have an altercation on your first shift and upset your fellow health workers so much that they walk out on you when you've only just started working on them? Like that is gonna be some severe lack of cultural sensitivity. Um, and when I read what happened, I actually got a lot more sympathy for, for Damien because the, what happened was a woman was admitted with a an untreatable, um, tumour that needed palliation but the understandings of palliative care were, were so different that um, he was put under a lot of pressure to allow this woman to be operated on by an untrained um, surgeon because they wanted to at least try so I think for me I would I mean ethically coming from our perspective I mean, you just you just wouldn't. It's just putting somebody through unnecessary suffering when you don't have adequate anaesthetics and when you don't think that they would be able to survive the anaesthetic. Um, yeah, it's 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 it, it, yeah. So you can you can really see why um, why that was that proved such a struggle. Um, and yeah, I'm enjoying it so far. I think I'm about hundred and yeah, I'm about here. So I'm getting through that relatively quickly. That was literally just on the train on the way home, which is like a two hour train ride. And I also read some other things. So I think this is not gonna take me very long. Um, it's got some cool illustrations as well. Like, where is it? There's like a little map of the town. Um, the one thing that I would say about his writing is there's just a little bit of a male gaze. Like, I don't really need to know about what the breasts of all of the women look like. Um, that's one of the maps of the compound where they work. Um, like when you get a patient in, I don't really want to know what her boobs look like. And I don't really want to feel like when I go to the doctor and if I were to have to be examined, I don't want to feel like that a male doctor is looking at my boobs. So I would just prefer that he didn't write those thoughts, at least in his book. Um, so yeah, I'm going to see how that evolves and if it improves at all, because at the moment it's a bit like, a bit uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, um, I think I will finish that probably this week. Then the next thing, I'm getting there, I'm getting there, um, is that last week I mentioned that I had been really enjoying reading academic papers and that I wanted to try and read one every week. So we had some nutrition le lectures this week. So I went to the library um, and I noticed on those nutrition lectures that broadly speaking, the, the bulk of mal malnutrition um, is spread across um, Africa and parts of Asia, um, but weirdly there was a bulge, we were using one of those, you know, those um, maps that blow up the countries that are most effective, um, there was a bulge around the country of Guatemala, and Guatemala is a country where I lived for three months, it's a really really beautiful country and it's definitely um, a place where I saw some people who did not look particularly well nourished, but I didn't realise that it had a bigger problem with malnutrition than other countries in the region, so I thought, oh, I wonder why that is, I went to the library and I looked up I think I just searched children nutrition Guatemala or something and I found I was looking for qualitative research because qualitative research is more fun to read it is less good in terms of 
decision making. You don't really want to be basing all of your decisions on qualitative research, but if I'm just reading these out of fun and interest, it's definitely normally more lively to read. So I found original article, Pathways of the Association Between Maternal Employment and Weight Status Among Women and Children, Qualitative Findings from Guatemala. Um, and this is a, an interview, semi-structured interviews using a grounded theory approach to of 20 women in a very small area called Takalikabaj, um, which is near to a town that is called Reu. Um, I never went there, but I just it's relatively close to where I was staying, so um, I thought it would be interesting. And it looks at um, a section of the mo mothers are in formal employment, a section are in informal employment, and a section are non-employed. And it looks at like what they spend their money on and how that affects their children's nutrition and how the fact that they're in work um, or out of work affects um, the food that they're able to give to their children. And I found it really interesting because there is this kind of um, received wisdom in um, development um, studies that if a woman has money, she will spend it on the health of her children. Um, and in general, it tends to be quite a good principle. But one of the things that came out in this is, um, to these mothers specifically, and with qualitative research, you're always really talking about what the people in the research say, and it's quite hard to generalize out of it. Um, but when they had money and when they had been doing their work or when they were thinking for their unemployed mothers um, about what they would do if they had more money, um, it was more about making their children happy rather than healthy. So for the, a couple of them, there are quotes where um, it's being able to buy the thing that your child has been asking for, finally. Like, they always go to the shop and they always work, ask for the chocolate marshmallows and finally you have the money so you're able to buy them chocolate marshmallows. Um, so it doesn't necessarily add up to, um, like, a health-promoting kind of behaviour. So I found that was quite interesting um, in that it kind of challenges this thing that we keep saying of, like, oh, mums will always make their kids healthy because... Um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily always work directly like that. And if you are spending more money, more of your time at work, maybe you have less time to pre prepare um, healthy foods for your children as well. So um, it did say that mothers tended to buy a greater variety of food when they were employed and had more access to money, which is, um, which is interesting. I suppose it, it, it depends like what your food environment is like, what you'll then end up, what variety you'll end adding in. Um, and it uses a lot of the word obesogenic food environment or the term obesogenic food environment um, to describe the, the food that is now on offer um, in this particular rural area of Guatemala compared to what used to be on offer. So um, broadly speaking, um, Guatemalan food in this area of the Western Highlands, it is basically composed of things made of maize, things made of beans, and things derived from chickens, so either chicken meat or chicken eggs. Um, and it's like being able to buy those chocolate marshmallows or being able to buy the pizza and so on um, marks a significant change in variety, but it doesn't um, necessarily mean an improvement in health. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to think what you would do about that in terms of, I know Mexico really struggles with um, weight gain and diabetes so they were one of the first countries to introduce quite a high sugar tax um which is obviously an option in that it will put that chocolate marshmallow back out of the reach of that um mother who wants to make a child happy but like is that really the right thing to do is that is that is that the best approach to the situation um or is it kind of like more nutritional information or yeah, it would just be interesting to, to look more into that. So anyway, that was my um, academic article. I would be interested to hear if you want to hear me talking about any articles that I read, and if I do, should I move it out into like a separate little video where I could do like a little, oh, this is the article this week. I could do like Fact Friday um, or something, like, I don't know. Um, or I could just mention it in this video and, and maybe not go on about it quite so much. So the first, the first, God, I'm getting confused. The last thing that I wanted to mention is that we are creating a book group at my work. So we've got a book basket um, where you can borrow and lend books into it. So I'm taking in all of the books that I have spare copies of. I'm going to take the casual vacancy because um, I don't like it enough to want to keep it, um, which is unusual for me because I do like to keep almost every book ever. Um, I'm going to put my names in all of them so I can get them back, but I had a couple of copies of King Lear, so I'm taking in King Lear. I'm taking a copy of Pride and Prejudice, The Hobbit, and The Return of the Native, and Test of the, ooh, Test of the Devils? No, Far From the Mudding Crowd. Um, 
So I know that this is quite a classics heavy selection and I don't know how many of my colleagues um, will really be going for the Hardys, um, but I might just stop off at a charity bookshop as well and pick up some more like lightweight options as well for people. Um, and I'm really excited to see how the book club, club works out. So I'm also gonna put, um, I'm hoping to put a whiteboard um, where people can put what they're currently reading so that we can see like who's borrowed what. Um, and I was thinking of putting in some post-it notes so that people can write on their post-it note um, and stick it inside the book, like a short review with no spoilers so that people can like pick up the book and see, oh, this person's read it and they thought this. Um, so yeah, so yeah, various ideas for that. So I'm very excited that that's finally happening because we've been talking about it for a while that we'd like to, to put something like into effect. And yeah, it's gonna be starting. We've also got a quote of the week board and my um, manager or my senior um, just turned around to me and said, oh, you can take care of that, Tilly. And I was like, oh, okay, can I? Um, so yeah, if you have any interesting, exciting quotes um, that would be suitable for a workplace environment that would like have amusing comments or just entertain us really um, please let me know your quote suggestions so that I can put them on the quote board because I'm feeling a lot of pressure here to to keep up the quote of the week board successfully um, so yeah let me know your quote ideas um, anyway thank you very much for watching um, let me know in the comments if you've read any, any of these and you know thoughts generally because um, I like hearing from you I like talking to you it's always good fun um, the other thing that I've been doing is trying to catch up on some booktube videos, but I'm still just at the start of nonfiction November and I feel really bad um, a lot of the time because I want to be involved in the current discussion, but I also don't want to ignore all of the videos that I haven't kept up with. So I don't know whether to just clear that hole, but there's, there's videos in there that I think look absolutely fascinating and I'm trying to keep the watch later list down to the ones that I do think are really fascinating. Um, but yeah, I've still got this massive, massive, backlog of about 400 videos so if I don't watch a video that you've produced now it's not because I don't want to watch it but then if I'm watching something that's from a month ago um, then I don't normally comment because it feels a little bit outdated but anyway um, that's just something that is causing me more stress than it should do for saying that this is entirely a hobby um, yeah nice speaking to you have a lovely week and I'll speak to you soon